Hey everyone, happy holidays and welcome back to Style and Origins. You know, the podcast that takes you to the origins of specific concepts related to corporate learning and development. And today I have two amazing guests. We are discussing the fabulous topic of voiceover, voiceover actors, voiceover in general. Voiceover is very popular in e learning design, obviously. And we've used it for also for our instructional videos. So there is a rich history of voiceover work in education and also in learning and development. And today I got two, not just one, two uh, very well-known professionals in the art of voiceover. Uh, Carrie Atchison is a voiceover actor and also David Goldberg, who is a celebrity of sorts, uh, <laughs> political voiceover. And uh, I'm really, really honored to have them here. Welcome, Carrie. Welcome, David. How are you? Thanks for having us. Yeah, thank We're you. We're delighted to be here. Fantastic. As you can tell, folks, this the quality of audio in this episode is going to be amazing because uh, I'm we're dealing with pros, professionals, <laughs> great mics. And if you're watching the video as well, you can see that. So, Carrie, um, tell us a little bit about your background. I know, you know, we have we have some interesting background there. You started in entertainment and uh, it's been it's been a road. It's been quite a road. So give us a quick synapse of that, of your background and what you've done so far. OK, well, I started voice acting playing a little boy in audio tapes for Japanese people learning to speak English in wow. Hollywood. And then I, that was just a fun thing to do. They promised they'd cast me as an adult, but then I left L.A. So I went on to spend the next 25 years teaching marketing and advertising on the college level. I earned my doctorate from USC in marketing and corporate communications. I taught at Northwestern University, helped start a new graduate program in corporate PR and advertising, that type of thing. Taught at the Peter Drucker Center in L.A., taught at uh, Northwestern USC and other other colleges while I slowed down to have children. And I um, have done a lot of training, uh, workshops, seminars, courses, uh, modular courses and such for AT&T, uh, ABC, Ford Motor Company, and a lot of small companies. Uh, recently, as I've explored my new career in um, voiceover, I've written three articles, two for Training Magazine and one for TD Magazine from the Association for Training Talent Development. And uh, I love the, the what they called the most recent one. They called it E-Learning Script Writing 101. So I wrote the book on script writing. <laughs> wow. okay. So wow. I've been very lucky. I sum up my career with a Steve Martin quote, and I get paid for doing this. So <laughs> I've been very lucky, and I'm finding my luck is holding as I uh, move into voice acting. And part of my luck was running across David Goldberg and twisting his arm to be my coach and, and helper along the way. And he's been wonderful. He's the chief edge officer of Edge Studio, which is the preeminent voiceover production studio and training source uh, for all of us wannabes out there. So well, with that intro, let's go to David. <laughs> I <don't. laughs> Um, you get Alexander, you gave me the best title ever. You said I'm the celebrity and I'm not a celebrity. I wish I was. I'm a celebrity director, a, a celebrity voice director. I work on a daily basis. I work with the celebrities and athletes, politicians, authors, and voice actors and help them use their voices in whatever capacity they need from recording uh, spokesperson commercials, uh, recording audio books, uh, playing, uh, roles in animated movies and, uh, I don't know everything in between. So it's, uh, I, I think Carrie, I like your expression from, uh, Steve Martin. Like, yeah, I, my days are amazing. Um, yeah. So it's fun. Fantastic. Uh, that's a fantastic occupation you have, but are there are some names you can share with us, the celebrities you work with. Oh my goodness. Uh, yeah. Barack every day. Obama. Yeah. I mean, we've done voiceover for Obama, but it's just, uh, it's a, an endless list. I mean, every week we have multiple celebrities in the studios. I have five, five studios right now in Manhattan. And so we have a, a nice swarm of uh, celebrities on, on a regular basis. And what's really actually, I think, more interesting is that my previous role prior to voiceover was in music. 
And that was really going to be my life. I started a studio. Um, in fact, my company truly began in my college dorm. I was recording local bands and that grew and grew. And next thing I know, I was playing with a lot of celebrities and uh, recording and engineering. Uh, and when my first son was born uh, 16 years ago, at that same time, the drugs in my studio were insane. There was so much so much drinking, so many crazy, crazy ass drugs. And, uh, and I just don't, that's not my lifestyle. I loved the work. I loved the, the people I worked with. Um, but I just, it just, it was a hard day. Like, and I was driving home from a studio once and I believe I was stoned from secondhand smoke and I pulled to the side of the road and I realized you know, like, this is just too much. And now I have like a, an infant at home. And so I switched my studio from music to voiceover. And uh, prior to switching, to, prior to making that switch, it was basically me. I had one assistant, uh, had a couple of uh, assistant engineers and things like that. One, one, sorry, one office assistant and a few assistant engineers. But the mixing, the engineering and all the playing was just me. Um, and so I'm still on lots of songs on the radio, which is always fun to hear, whether I'm playing keys or drums or mixes that I've worked on. Uh, and it's always exciting to hear that stuff on the radio. But more importantly, um, I made the switch and there are no more drugs in the studios now. <laughs> so, um, so I miss music, but I also absolutely love what I do right now. Wow. Well, you know, I will say, you know, if you're dealing with um, entertainers at that level. Yeah. And, and then at that time, of course, very, very natural that you uh, had to experience those things out there. And uh, yeah, I know you mentioned, uh, Carrie mentioned that uh, expression that uh, phrase by, um, by Martin. And I was uh, thinking that you know, in the in in the military, you know, you guys also know I'm a U.S. Navy vet. Um, in the military, we say uh, it's a little more sarcastic, but we say all oh, this and a paycheck too. <laughs> ah, okay, same thing. Yeah. Yeah, sort of speaking. <laughs> Sometimes it's a little more sarcastic. <laughs> well, <laughs> my, seriously, I thank you for what you you know you're serving. That that is remarkable, and thank you for that. Well, yes. thanks. Appreciate it. I'm I'm very um, very excited that you both made the time to be here, and uh, thank you so much. So. Let's talk about voiceover. Where does this start? Obviously, I can hint uh, from the beginning that, you know, just as scary started her, her career entertainment. I mean, radio probably was the first place, right, for voiceover? Well, early, early on, they uh, in the mid-1800s, lots of people were trying to figure out how to create sound on some sort of device, uh, grind it into some uh, audio uh, microphone of some sort. And um, in 1860, one gentleman came up with uh, waveforms and did something called In the Moonlight, where he did a phonogram. And then there was a talking clock in 78. And then in 1900, Reginald Fessenden came up with the the technology to make a broadcast of, first he just sent out the weather in 1900, and it went about three blocks. And then in, by 1906, he had perfected that technology. And basically, he was recording sound on a um, device. What was it called? A Vitaphone. And, um, and in 1906, he sent out Christmas carols and uh, stories and that type of thing that went 11 miles. So he is given credit for being the first, first ever, even though he wasn't officially the first ever. And right. then in... In 1926, BBC revolutionized broadcasting, and they basically set out to fight propaganda. I see. And what what, what what is your source for this one, uh, Carrie? I'm curious. Uh, there are a number of good articles out there. One was by Volquint that you just made reference okay, to. No, okay. I stole most of this material from them. No, okay. And yeah, no, it no, said no. part uh, part uh, one of history. Yeah, it's uh, it's good to find that because sometimes it's not a it's easy to find. I, I do have an article here um, that I'll put all, all the links, folks, will put in the description of the episode. You can find them there. Um, there was a nice article written by this gentleman, uh, uh, Blackman is the, the author, and uh, I guess he was an aficionado of either radio engineering or whatnot, and uh, it's the ghost of Reginald Fessenden. And yep. uh, Fessenden was uh, credited also as being very a precocious type of learner. So very, uh, very good. Not so much like a uh, book smart, but very creative, very individual thinker. And so yeah, he, he was an inventor. Yeah. He said, uh, he said, uh, 
he actually got a bunch of money at one point and uh, got some involved with some people in Pittsburgh that were rich and rich aristocrats and created this station, uh, sort of this first station where he conducted that test that you're talking about, the first test, which was uh, between two towers. It was about uh, a mile and a half or five miles or something like that. So after that, obviously, I mean, in the involvement in, in the relationship between this, that first event or those first events, I mean, um, incredibly enough, the invent, whoever is credited to be the inventor is actually an Italian guy, Marconi, to invent the radio, the actual device. Oh, sure. But, um, but we have radio in the 1920s, you know, uh, you mentioned the BBC and the propaganda in, in, from educational perspectives, we have educational radio. So actually, uh, folks that lived in rural areas they didn't have access to schools or, you know, there were not that many schools to begin with. And at that time, if we think about it, 1906, I covered this before in other episodes where we start having the industrial revolution, so to speak. Right. And so mm -hmm. we, we had a great movement in for, because of world war one called the emergency fleet corporation. And that's required that a lot of people start coming out of the fields and helping out in the cities to build ships, uh, work in the shipyards. But the big problem that we had then and the big problem we had until probably 1940 was the literacy. Not a lot of people oh, okay. and could read and, you know, to the level that, that was needed and whatnot. So achieve amazing things there. Educational radio was a big part of that. Of course, when we, I guess, I, I, you know, I don't have any samples. I guess I'll, I'll, I'll scour to, through YouTube and see if I find some actual samples of this educational radio. I wonder what it was like, you know. <laughs> yeah, well, radio dramas were big at that point. Exactly, so yeah. The family <laughs> gathered around the radio and listened to stories. I wonder that, that. There's a newer version of that now. These uh, these uh, radio story hours that are now be, you subscribe to and you can listen to episodes monthly. I wanted to ask you, though, uh, this is something I was always curious in my own personal, and this is for both of you. Where does the style come from? Because there was, you know, every time you listen, at least for me, every time you listen to anything from the 1950s or 1940s, it seemed to be very, you know, yeah, there was a time where we, there are, you know, you know, that style is a difference in today. Obviously we don't do that. We're, we're very more like, you know, I don't know, colloquial and, and whatever. Maybe it was the same there. It was it some kind of traditional schooling or any idea? Well, so many people in voiceover came out of radio, don't you think, David? That <clears throat> And radio has that kind of announcer in your face approach. And so a lot of people now trying to train to be voice actors, everything now is conversational. And so they have to sort of deprogram themselves away from that because it's no longer copacetic. How's that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I've read quite a bit over the years. Um, I've heard a lot of stories and and very different stories. Um, but the account that seems to hold true the most, and, and which also makes the most sense, at least logically to me, is that when microphones first were becoming more popular, they didn't pick up the the high end frequencies as well as the the fuller, louder sounds. Like voice actors needed to be loud to get volume through them. And so, what I've heard is that. Back in the days, whether that was the 1920s or the 40s, I don't know. But when microphones were in, sort of in their infancy, the the broadcasters, the voice actors needed to really sort of project. And, and you came out with that, that fuller, louder sound. And at the same time, voiceover was originally just audio. It wasn't synced to visual. It was just, a, a, like you said, Carrie, a radio drama, for example, uh, or the weather being broadcast. So there was no visual, so you needed more excitement or more enthusiasm in the voice to capture the audience. Whereas today, if you watch a typical commercial on TV, Alexander, as you said, uh, you're 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 completely uh, accurate. That the voiceover or the voice actor rather will be pretty copacetic, pretty colloquial, and, and so on. But there's still energy because we're watching the, a commercial that has exciting music in the background and sound effects that are really strategically placed. I mean, that's what we do. We have a whole mix room and we do just that like all day long. And um, and the, so the music captivates, the sound effects captivate, the visuals and the graphics captivate. And so if if everything was on like if the voice was still uh, over the top enthusiastic, I think the commercial would have too much energy. It would seem kind of ridiculous. 
So since there is energy coming from other sources, now the voiceover can back off and be more natural. Also, third part to this is that, and Carrie, you said it already, families used to listen to a single radio, so they would all gather around, so the voice actor was projecting to a whole room full of people, right? But today, in almost every application, when people listen to voiceover, it is a it's a solitary activity. Like, like you, Alexander, if you watch a documentary on TV, you're probably by yourself, maybe with one other person. If you listen to a commercial on TV, if you listen to an audiobook, if you call your bank and hear the the uh, automated telephone greeting saying, you know, press one for this, press two for that. And in almost every application, listening to voiceover is a solitary activity. So the voice actor knows they're talking to one person. Mm. And if you're talking to one person, it would be pretty weird if you yelled or did a broadcast thing. You know, if I got onto the, into this call, there's just three of us here. If I got on and I said, you know, hey, guys, I mean, it's, it would sound ridiculous yeah. if i was on stage in front of a thousand people maybe that would be okay but so i think for all of these reasons voiceover is really uh it general not always but generally uses a very natural style there are five or six examples of voiceover that don't require a natural style uh in fact let me just expand upon that briefly there are roughly 25 genres in our industry in the voiceover industry and roughly 20 of them really do use a very natural style of voice and five don't and what's interesting is so when people listen to voiceover, they don't notice the 20 genres that have a natural delivery because the delivery is so natural. There's no reason for it to stand out. People only really take note of the, the five genres, which are sort of unnatural. And so when people want to get the, into the voiceover world, when they want to become voice actors, the only thing they, they're processing in their head are the unnatural styles, the announcer styles. So it's, it's funny, but when people want to become voice actors, they take their natural voice and then they kind of try to do it up and make it all broadcasty. And we have to say, no, 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 don't do that. No, nope. just use your natural voice. Hmm. Wow. You yeah. know, in 1928, uh -huh. the, like I said, that when we were talking ahead of time, the technology kind of drove the industry as well. And in 1928, Steamboat Willie came out with Mickey Mouse and mm -hmm. it was voiced by Walt Disney himself. And he actually did Mickey Mouse until 1947. But that was the first real example of um, uh, you, the use of voiceover plus sound effects and video. And then, of course, cartoons exploded after that. But that lasted all through the 1930s, uh, through Tarzan and till 36, when Mel Blanc came around, the man of a thousand voices who did Daffy Duck and all of those oh, okay. characters, okay. Looney yeah. Tunes characters. and. Uh, so it really kind of evolved, and it follows the technology to this day. Yeah, no, and so it's uh, that, that's a great point you brought up, uh, Carrie, and also uh, David. The the notion of the mics, I, I I didn't think of that before, and that makes sense. That makes complete sense because it's almost like a, it's almost like a voice power device in a way, right? So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yep. That and now, like at the other extreme, now there's ASMR, which is like the softest type of voiceover recording, right? And we can do that these days. Because yeah. the microphones are so clear, even an inexpensive USB microphone, like a hundred dollar USB microphone, is pretty darn good these days, and um, and doesn't have that much background noise. And so, yeah, if we've really gone yeah. from like one end of the spectrum, I think, to the other at this point. I may add, they also have the patterns, right? So they have the cardioid patterns, and they don't. They're not like mm -hmm. you know, people's like, hey, don't use your laptop mic because it's gonna pick up everything. Is have is have the omnit the the what do they call that? Omni variable pattern or something. So oh, yes. Omni would be everything. Figure eight would be two sided right. cardioid. There's hypercardioid, supercardioid. And then, of course, there's shotgun microphones, which would be the, the most direct pickup pattern. It's the direct pickup pattern. Yeah. Which, I, you know, I always, uh, I'm always impressed with the, with movies, right? And how they, uh, they're able to record, you know, um, dialogue and kill all the noise around it. And, uh, because I imagine, wow, they're in the middle, they're out there in the park. There's got to be, come on, this, this, you hear nothing, you just hear. Well, but also a lot of that is cleaned up. Like one of the, th like uh, I mentioned earlier, our mix room, one of our five rooms in New York is a mix room. And so what we do in that room is a lot of cleanup of soundtracks. Okay. So um, like, uh, so it's called um, ADR, dialogue replay, uh, automatic uh, dialogue replacement. And so 
very often we are cleaning up. We're using uh, voice actors who can do voice matches or the celebrities that uh, come in themselves and re-record lines and stuff. It's great when it can be captured live, of course, but there's inevitably something that goes wrong somewhere in recording. A line has to be changed, re-recorded. A siren went off somewhere and they had to, re, you know, we have to re-record. So. Okay. Yeah. I imagine this, that's maybe why movies take so many, so long to make. <laughs> yeah. Well, and so much money. Yeah, it's uh, when you get into the process of it, the, you know, we just we only deal with the soundtrack end of it. You know, the sound effects, the, the Foley, the, uh, you know, the, all the ADR, the, the lines and stuff. And yeah, it's a uh, it's a very, very long process. OK, so we have a connection then when we're talking about things, everything we talked about. We have radio, um, educational radio. And, and since the last I was talking to Kara about this before we started recording in the last, what, eight years or so or maybe 10 years podcasts have been the thing, right? It's, it's a very popular medium again, and it's, it's replaced video in many respects, although it's now integrated. If you look at Spotify mm -hmm. and you watch some episodes, um, what are your thoughts on that? Is uh, It's sort of a democratization, right, of, of the art per se, not so much vo voiceover, but, you know, the medium has, has come up to life, has it helped your, your industry in a sense? Then more people are into podcasting and mics and whatnot. I see a lot of uh, folks that do voiceover on YouTube, for example, uh, giving tutorials and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. Your thoughts well, on as that? David was saying, it's all very one-to-one. -one. And part of the reason that that's even possible is that everybody, the, the forms of media have exploded. You know, we're now doing everything on our cell phones mm -hmm. or or on your laptop or your tablet or your whatever. So the ability to talk one-to-one -one with someone through a podcast or through whatever is much simpler. And that also changed training in e-learning because your learners, not only are they no longer in the office, they're out there at home working on their, their own laptop, but right. they, they learn on the run. Okay. You know, they may be listening to your e-learning course in the car on their cell phone. Well, let's talk so it's all the, over the place. Good. Let's uh, let's then talk about it and wrap this up with a good conversation about the dark horse of um, pretty much everything. Because I mean, even my industry, learning and development, and everybody else seems to now just be talking about AI, right? And I'm imagining oh. there's two sides of this. Obviously, there's the the threat of AI in terms of voiceover. There are products out there that put out some pretty good output. It sounds very, very convincing human wise. You still got to take some time to kind of work the pauses and things like that. But I mean, I tested a few things out there like well set, for example, and they put out, I mean, it's, it's, it's scary in a sense. Um, there's also the positive side of it. So there's, I'm imagining that there are some AI components that you might be using in your studio, uh, David, for example, uh, that maybe help with the workflow of things of, of recording. So, Tell me about that. Let's talk about the let's talk about probably the scary part first. Like, what are your thoughts on this on AI and those generation engines that we have? Certainly, it's something that we had to learn a lot about. Uh, I don't think I'm essentially convinced that it will not damage our industry in a big way. Uh, AI has been around for so long; it's not just the past year. It's become more common, I think, since ChatGPT kind of launched a year or whatever it was ago. But it's been out for so long. And, you know, like um, like if you go to a function these days, how many people hire a professional photographer, right? Most people just take pictures on their phones. And, and the camera on your phone is pretty darn good. But there's still a place for professional photographers. Right. And that is, I believe, the way it is in all industries, from artists, a graphic artists, and music composition. Like there's always a need for a human being who excels in an area. I don't think I don't think there will ever be a day when there are no professional photographers, no professional musicians, no professional voice actors, no professional actors, no professional models. I mean, there will be few fewer of us, but there will still be an area of specialty. And I cross my fingers that we stay in, you know, in that top uh, ranking of voice actors and, and studios and stay in there. And, you know, right now we're we're amazingly busy. And we have so many customers coming to us saying, we tried AI, it didn't work, and we want to hire humans. We also have some who say, we hired, uh, we went to any of the AI shops, like Eleven Labs or whatever, and, and we have voiceover, and it's pretty convincing, exactly as you said, Alexander, but you can't 
like you said, you can take some time and, and control where you put pauses, but you can't really take time and say, I want a bit more spontaneity on this word, and maybe a little sarcasm on this word, make this sound a bit more genuine or authentic and that you can't do. It just, and maybe one day it can be done, but right now it can't be done. So we've had um, uh, audiobook uh, production companies or publication companies say, we tried AI, we thought we'd save a ton of money. No one liked the books, we're going back human. We're only, we will never go non-human. We just booked another, we, we have been doing a lot of video games, like the narration, the soundtracks for video games, a whole lot of them recently. We just booked another one uh, today. We've booked like three this week. And this particular one started back in March of 2023. So like seven months or no, that would be nine months. They've been going back and forth. My assumption is that they tried AI and now they've come back and they're going human. Uh, I don't know for sure, but after nine months, they come in and they want to get it recorded by the middle of January. So I know this, that's my guess. <laughs> and so, yeah, I don't know. I think there's a place for voice actors. I think that you do. I think the industry has shifted. I think that some of the lower areas of voiceover where lower areas is the wrong word to use. I think some of the areas of voiceover where um, uh, direction, voice direction is not really all that important. That will probably all are vastly go to AI. So if you call your bank and it says for sales, press one, or if it's for sales, press one, or maybe it says for sales, press one, like if whatever way it says it, it's fine. You don't need a voice director to say, we want it this way or that way. So maybe that goes to AI, but commercials, video games, anywhere where human performance is needed, at least right now, we are super duper busy. Makes sense. I, I, Alex, yeah. one, of, one of the articles I wrote was to develop a, uh, a model on how to decide when to use AI and when to use humans. Okay. I started out by writing an article on how you should never use anything but humans, and I ended up writing a decision-making model. We all use AI. Yeah, you know, uh, like I, I, I know voice actors who like are so turned off by AI, and I want to point out to them: you use AI when you use your phone. You like. You know, they're upset with uh, AI taking over their job, but then they're using their phone at a function and they're taking over a, a professional photographer who would have done that a few years ago. I mean, we all, we're all participating in this. And yes, uh, we do have software tools that we use uh, that help uh, file naming uh, for, uh, for file naming, which is a huge part of what we do for our long recordings or like GPS recordings and, and telephony systems. We do a lot of file naming and AI can help us with that. AI can help clean up background noise in recordings. So when we do get things from a movie, for example, and there's terrible sirens in the background or whatever noise in the background, sometimes we can use an AI tool and get rid of the background noise. And we don't need to bring in the actors or at least re-record as much of the dialogue. Yeah. And I mean, you can replace, I mean, in the case, let's say if we're looking for someone with Carrie's characteristics, uh, you know, and the expertise and stuff like that, you can replace that. Uh, you have to, you know, the emotion and the, and I think, you know, the human as you said, the human touch still, we're humans, you know, it's needed. Yeah. It's there. And the voiceover is really important in e-learning. You know, it makes it more credible. It gives it depth and gives it context. It makes more complex ideas, easier to understand, and people relate to it. Hmm. You, you sometimes will choose the voice actor according to who your audience is so that they can make a human connection that AI simply can't do. Right, right. And so... Um, do you think uh do you think that the uh work of a lot of folks try to go in house like learning and development folks try to go in house um do you think that's better do you think that can work or um i mean obviously you may have a bias i mean you're in the business no <laughs> no i mean i think it it's, uh, it depends on many variables uh, there are there are so many corporations who put out so much voiceover work that they do have internal departments. It makes sense, okay. right? You know, like a company, if it's large enough, they will have their own marketing team rather than hiring out another marketing agency. And, you know, it just does make sense for them. And one of the things that we've done over the years is we've actually gone in and we've developed like a side business and we go in and we train those departments. So that's been a, a nice like side gig for, uh, for our business, for my business. So we have people at my business who will go and work at a company for a day, a week, whatever. We will help them set up uh, acoustically appropriate studios. Like your studio looks great there, Alexander, for, you know, what I can see here. Um, 
we can train them on how to use microphones because we go into places sometimes and you, you've heard, I'm sure, when someone is recording through a lousy microphone, like you said, your laptop microphone in an echoey room and it sounds really bad. And so sometimes they just need some education. So we go and we train their teams and we've done this for I don't know, a whole lot of organizations, government agencies, corporations. So that's been great for us. So I think there's there's every reason why a company should do it in house. I mean, it'd be great if they always came to our studios, but it's that's not you know it's just not realistic. Gary, what's your situation? Since you have been uh, writing articles for ATV and other places. Yep. Um, on ask me again. What? Yeah, on the on the what is your take on that of. Uh, uh, folks going in house, uh, learning and development. Oh, okay. Well, I think it's great that David goes out there and trains them. I think um, it can be a real mistake. I did a lot of research before coming here today, and yeah. I was doing some digging, and there were some articles on saying, oh, we should go in house all the time. You can do it. You're the expert. That yeah. doesn't mean you know how to communicate it. Yep. It doesn't mean you know how to change your pitch and your pace and your tone and all of those things that a professional voice actor is trained to do to really bring life to the subject matter. It's also very helpful, however, when you choose your voice actor, if they have some background in your area. So like the doctor doing uh, medical voiceover is mm -hmm. very helpful because he, he or she can pronounce the terminology. Though, though in-house, of course, part of my perspective is, no, you shouldn't do that. You should hire me instead. <laughs> so, <laughs> but it's it's out there and in what david said people who are doing a lot of this it makes sense for them cost effectively okay. to, yeah, do it, and, to do it in-house and then maybe even bring in a professional like david to train them how to do it right so basically they're training them in voice acting okay yeah and it, it may not necessarily be me i mean it may be someone else from my company who goes in and trains but you're right mm -hmm. carrie if you and i want to expand upon something you said you mentioned a, a doctor uh, talk, reading a medical voiceover script or a pharmaceutical script, and because they know the, the the jargon, they can pronounce the complicated words, and that's great. But there's even more to it, I think, and that is that when someone talks or reads a script, when they talk about something that they are familiar with, or especially that they enjoy, that passion, that understanding, that mm -hmm. is translated to the ears of the listener. It's it's remarkable, the difference of even two two voice actors. One who has a medical, and by the way, two voice actors who can both speak medical jargon, but one has a passion for this. They went to school, they train, they they enjoy, they work in that industry. If they read it compared to someone who can speak the words but don't doesn't really care, they don't really care about medical stuff. That that second person that there's just there's like it's a, it's a dry read. When a real professional who is a subject matter expert reads something and talks about something. Yeah, that comes right through and it really interests the listener. So we all, most of the time when we have something scientific, um, uh, whether it's religion, sports, any, any interesting subject matter, we usually try to find a voice actor who has some experience or, or a lot of experience in that industry. And it does make a big difference. Yeah. It's a credibility factor, which is also yeah, a big part of anybody doing presentations or, or doing uh, public speaking. So yeah, I can see that. Well, it's been an amazing time. Thank you both of you for being in this episode of Style of Origins. I'm really glad that um, we got finally together. I know it was a challenge to kind of get together. And so uh, where can they find you, David? Uh, let us know uh, where you're at, websites and things like that. Yeah, the website is edgestudio.com. Very easy. All right, cool. Carrie, yeah. And thank you for having us. I am, my company is named after a cow. It's called Utter Voiceovers, U-T-T-E-R. And I'm Carrie, K-E-R-I, at uttervoiceovers.com. And you can check out my website. I have the most hilarious video demos you have ever seen because David produced them. And thank you so much for having us. Absolutely. It's been a pleasure. Thank you, everyone. And uh, once again, uh, Merry Christmas to everyone. Happy holidays. Uh, whatever it is you celebrate, I wish you peace and happiness. And uh, thank the both of you for being here. And thank you so much. And I just want to say I've seen your stuff online and it's terrific. So thank you for what you do. Oh, for I serving agree. and for and for your profession too. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Yes.